everybody. Welcome, welcome. Happy Earth Day. Just getting, just going to need a couple of minutes to let everybody come in from the waiting room, but we'll get started very soon. All right, nice. Happy Thursday. I hope all of the snow is gone where everyone is right now. Um, so while we're sort of waiting for everyone to come in and get started, we're going to do a little bit of housekeeping and sort of some introductions. And is this going to work for us? Yes. All right. Uh, so my name is Natasha. I'm the Living City Program Manager at Ecology Ottawa. Um, and we also have Jess on the line, who's one of our lead volunteers, who's going to be talking to us about some of the plants that we have for sale through our fundraiser. Um, so you guys are going to be uh, muted throughout this presentation, uh, but please feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to write a welcome message to you guys. So to find the chat, if you want to move your mouse around your screen, a bar should pop up at the bottom where you'll be able to click uh, chat. It'll look like a, a speech bubble that you can click on. Um, and it should be flashing now that I've put something in there. So please feel free to write any questions or comments you have, uh, and we'll do our best to get to them. And with that being said, though, I do have a disclaimer at the beginning of this presentation. So it's actually a very common and completely understandable misconception uh, <laughs> that the staff at Ecology Ottawa are either ecologists or arborists or urban planners um, or something like that. And in reality, our role is really as community organizers. Um, we sort of think of ourselves as generalists. Uh, but I want to say right off the bat that I'm not a... Um, uh, I'm not a biodiversity subject matter expert, although I do know probably more than the average person um, at this point, for sure. I've done a lot of research and I'm really lucky to be able to consult with local experts. Um, however, I did want to be completely transparent with you guys that it's quite possible you'll have amazingly intelligent questions uh, that I won't be able to answer. So please still ask them, put them in the chat. If uh, I'll, I'll answer them all to the best of my ability. And if there's any that I am not able to answer, I'll do my best to in, uh, figure it out and include it in the um, follow-up email that you guys are gonna be receiving on Monday, uh, it, which will also include the uh, recording of this webinar and uh, an additional links to uh, stuff we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so, which brings us to what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, we're going to be discussing a fairly wide variety of, of things, all centered around biodiversity, of course. So we're gonna be going over uh, some of the things we do at Ecology Ottawa, uh, uh, Earth Day naturalization and rewilding, um, and pollinator gardens, which includes the official launch of our, our, of our fir first spring pollinator garden fundraiser. I'm really excited to show you what we've put together and the pollinator plants that we have available for you guys online um, until later next month. So very last thing before we dive in is I wanted to acknowledge that I am joining today from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people um, that is now known as Ottawa. I think this is especially important to recognize today, um, particularly given what we're talking about. This whole concept of naturalization, of nature-based solutions to climate change, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> nature-based solutions to climate change is gaining a lot of popularity right now, which is really exciting. Uh, however, I think it's really important to acknowledge that a lot of the practices that we're talking about today are in fact traditional Indigenous knowledge. These things are not new, and I would hate to present them as such. Uh, it's, it's really wonderful that governments around the world are starting to embrace uh, these practices, but they did not come up with them and neither did we. Um, so I encourage you to keep that in mind, uh, not only throughout this presentation, but also 
in your day-to-day -day lives as these topics become more popular and more mainstream, let's not forget where they originated from. All right, so I'm thrilled that I see so many new faces and so many new names in the participant list here. So I wanted to share a little bit about who we are at Ecology Ottawa and what we do, excuse me. Um, and let us know in the chat too, while I'm uh, telling you guys, where did you hear about us? How did you come across uh, this webinar? We would really, uh, I'm really interested to know how you heard about us. Uh, so we are a not-for-profit grassroots and volunteer-driven organization working to make Ottawa the green capital of Canada. Um, we work in to achieve this in two main ways. We do a lot of community organizing, uh, which where we give residents the tools they need to uh, make the changes they want to see in their uh, environment and communities. Um, uh, and as we do this, we're sort of, sorry, my cat is throwing a bit of a tantrum in the background there. Um, my apologies. So as we do this community engagement, we're uh, uh, what we call finding our friends. We're creating a, a, sorry, we're mobilizing a network of people in Ottawa who care for the environment like we do and who wanna see the same changes. Um, and, and really that is how we're able to do the second thing that Ecology Ottawa does, which is, um, which is uh, political activism and holding or advocacy and holding um, City Hall accountable to the environmental decisions they make and oftentimes uh, encouraging them to make better decisions for our shared environment. So the work that we do at Ecology Ottawa uh, the work that we do at Ecology Ottawa is split up into three main, what I like to call our program buckets. So uh, we have the active city, which focuses on healthy transportation type issues. So making the roads safe for uh, all modes of transportation, not just cars. Uh, the renewable city, which focuses on climate change issues. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with um, our 15 minute neighborhood campaign and the work that uh, Rob and Cheryl, uh, the executive director and climate change coordinator, uh, are doing uh, around Ottawa's official plan and working with different groups in Ottawa uh, uh, to, to influence the official plan. Um, and then there's the Living City. And as I said, I'm the Living City program manager, so this is where I live. And uh, I, we focus on uh, everything to do with trees, green space, and biodiversity. Uh, or excuse me, trees, green space, and water. And we have two active campaigns at the moment, biodiversity and our tree campaign. Um, so this webinar today is part of our biodiversity event series. Ecology Ottawa has been spearheading uh, climate action in Ottawa for over a decade, and it's really exciting that we're able to spearhead biodiversity as well. And I'm loving the, um, the feedback from everyone. Thank you so much. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. So before we get into all the really exciting rewilding and pollinator content, I uh, would be amiss if I didn't take a moment to say happy Earth Day. I find the history of Earth Day really interesting. And uh, so uh, I'm going to share a little bit of it with you today. Uh, so the first Earth Day took place in 1970, which was 51 years ago. Um, and, and the environmental movement as we know it today was born out of the protests in the, that were happening throughout the 60s. The women's rights movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement, the civil rights movement, and the students movement were huge influences. Uh, for example, many women's groups were, that were already established uh, were inspired to get involved in environmentalism when they learned about the negative health effects of synthetic pesticides. Uh, simultaneously, people were becoming more aware of the environmental hazards of chemical weapons that were being used in the war. Uh, this, along with the support of a very active university student uh, group, 
really uh, sort of led to the first Earth Day in 1970, which did lead to a significant amount of environmental policies being implemented in the States and Canada um, uh, throughout, throughout that decade and, and I think later on too. Um, after that, the environmental movement and the protests and the action, the collective action around the environmental movement did die down a bit. Um, and I think there's some lessons we can learn, uh, especially now considering we're sort of seeing this really big wave of protests again. Uh, there's some lessons we can learn about the need to stay active and keep pressure on our elected officials and recognize that collective action can have an impact. So I'm so happy Earth Day. Thank you guys so much for being here. I'm thrilled to be part of such a, an amazing and passionate movement. All right. So we're going to talk quickly about biodiversity in general. Sorry. Here we go. Uh, so I was actually asked not too long ago, what climate problems keep me up at night? And my, my answer was immediately biodiversity decline in Ottawa and all over the world. Biodiversity is nature. Uh, and globally, species are going extinct at a thousand times the natural rate. In Canada, we have over 700 species at risk, uh, over 60 of which live in the Ottawa area. Those facts really do keep me up at night, and I could sit here probably for this whole hour and talk about my personal belief in the intrinsic value of, of all the species uh, uh, we have here on Earth. But I think what actually worries and keeps me up at night more than this is, is that so many people um, seem to not understand the significance of what this actually means. When we talk about biodiversity decline, at a very surface level, of course, we're talking about the decrease in the variety of life on Earth. But it's so much more than that. We humans rely on healthy ecosystems to survive. These healthy ecosystems and these healthy and biodiverse ecosystems provide us with what are called ecosystem services. Uh, some of them are listed on the slide there, as you can see. These support us in so many ways. And we absolutely need them for the for our survival. For example, our, our food system relies on pollinators and healthy soils. Our cultural and tourism industry relies on nature for recreation and for spirituality. Uh, and, and so, so importantly, nature provides regulatory services that we absolutely need to conserve if we want to tackle climate change. Uh, for example, uh, I'm, as I'm sure many of you know, healthy urban forests will store carbon, help purify um, water and air, help reduce the urban heat island effect, all while simultaneously benefiting human health and providing habitat to local wildlife. Uh, another example is how vo valuable pollinators are, which is especially relevant today. It's estimated actually that a third of the world's food supply depends on pollinators. So one out of every three bites you take, uh, you, can, you can thank a pollinator. All right, so I really like these two maps. Uh, so as you can see, most species at risk are found in the most densely populated areas of the country, which means that cities have an essential role to play in conserving biodiversity. This is especially true when you consider that by 2050, 70% of the world's 9 billion people will be living in cities. Urban areas are rapidly expanding. Uh, and if we're going to preserve biodiversity, uh, preserve those ecosystem services that we rely on as a species, we as a society have to start reimagining our, our relationship with nature. Uh, plus, if we want to combat climate change, we need to start seriously integrating nature-based solutions into our city planning. Uh, nature-based approaches, they're also referred to as uh, cli uh, natural climate solutions or nature-based solutions to climate change or 
nature-based climate solutions. <laughs> There's lots of different variations on the term, uh, but they all in, uh, include actions such as better ecosystem management and uh, the integration of natural infrastructure in, in cities. And it was actually, I don't know if any of you guys saw the, um, uh, Elon Musk, the Tesla guy, he tweeted out recently um, about about some, he'll give a bunch of money to someone who comes up with the best carbon sequestration technology. And uh, it was funny because a lot of the nature organizations were sharing this tweet around telling him, uh, well, that would be trees, that would be the forest. Uh, will you please put money into them? And uh, that's not by any means uh, to discount the need for, for innovation and new technologies within the climate movement, but I thought it was kind of a funny, that was kind of a funny one. Um, all right, but one of the ways we can do, um, do this and implement these nature-based solutions is uh, by rewilding Ottawa. And this is what our new biodiversity campaign is actually all about. But what on earth are we talking about? What on earth does this mean? What am I saying to you right now? Um, so first of all, we use rewilding and naturalizing interchangeably. And what it is, is a method of conservation that helps nature thrive. Uh, in, in urban spaces in particular, rewilding is about reimagining our relationship with nature. It involves a uh, deliberate planting of native species and allowing this vegetation to become uh, established through natural regeneration. So it's the opposite of a, a manicured green lawn. Uh, however, it's not the extreme opposite of a manicured green lawn. Uh, and what I mean by that is, is I want to be completely clear, we're not advocating for the complete removal of human management, uh, uh, human involvement in green space management. We are not trying to tell you or city staff or anyone to, uh, to let your green space completely overgrow with no management at all. That's absolutely not what this is about. Um, there needs to be a balance, essentially. We as a species cannot be removed from nature. We are part of nature. And frankly, we need to learn how to coexist better, excuse me, with the rest of our, our natural environment. So, as I mentioned earlier, Cities are, are embracing the idea of rewilding around the world. These are just some uh, uh, screenshots of articles that I've been reading recently and different um, initiatives and policies from different cities. Uh, Vancouver has a rewilding strategy. Um, Naturevation is a really great um, initiative in, in Europe, I believe. Um, this article is about a bunch of different cities in Europe doing this work. Barcelona is doing really cool work um, around this uh, around this topic and sort of greening up their city. Um, and this article was recent. I think it was just a couple days ago. It came out about um, uh, rewilding in Australia. So, if Ottawa is serious about a green and just recovery from the COVID pandemic. Uh, and keeping up sort of in general, um, uh, rewilding initiatives must be prioritized. We'll get off this messy slide. So you guys are actually getting a sneak peek of our newest petition. It will be up on our website tomorrow. Uh, we were unfortunately having some technical difficulties today um, and we weren't able to have it up for, for right now, but uh, it should be up by tomorrow and it will absolutely be um, in that follow-up email that I'm gonna be sending you guys on Monday. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I really do hope you take a moment on, on Monday or, or later to sign it uh, and we'll, we'll talk about why and sort of, um, uh, yeah, we'll talk about why in a moment. So 
It reads, we are urging council to take ambitious action uh, to conserve and restore nature in Ottawa by making bold financial and political commitments to rewild our city. We urge council to amend bylaws to encourage residents to transform their yards and boulevards into naturalized gardens. Boulevards are the, um, like it's usually grass in between the sidewalk and the curb. Um, so, and second, allocate more money to naturalization throughout city park or through city park budgets. Uh, three, increase naturalization targets for city parks. Four, prioritize conservation of existing green space. Um, uh, educate the and five, educate the public on the benefits of rewilding. Sorry, I was just catching up on what's going on in the chat. Um, you guys are great. All right. So we're going to break these down a little bit, though. Uh, so the first thing, more naturalized yards and boulevards. We're asking them to amend uh, the property standards bylaw, the property maintenance bylaw, the use and care of roads bylaw in order um, to incur, not just allow, but to encourage residents to transform their lawns and boulevards to eco-friendly gardens that provide critical habitat for pollinators. Um, these bylaws could be substantially improved. Uh, they, they need to be, like I said, amended to, to uh, allow residents to do this and to encourage them to do this. Uh, while, while noting too, there are certainly legitimate health and safety concerns that these bylaws address, such as um, road visibility. Um, but the way that they're currently written um, results in residents sticking to grass lawns despite knowing that manicured lawns are a desert for pollinators uh, and most wildlife and residents are often reluctant to take their chances with these bylaws for for fear of having to tear up their garden and all their hard work or uh, fear of getting fined uh, this fear and uncertainty is a major barrier for Ottaw ottawans who who would like to support urban biodiversity. There was actually something in the news recently about someone who was um, uh, they had they had their their plants on their front yard in um, tires and they had paint like car tires and they had painted them um, as planters. And I guess they must have got a complaint because bylaw came over and it turned out that they they didn't end up getting fined um they didn't end up having to tear down their um take take the garden away that they built however sorry the cats are having a field day <laughs> um uh, however that that fear of having to do that it's basically if someone complains it is up to the bylaw officer's discretion whoever responds uh, what they want to do with this garden, if they're going to make you tear it down or fine you or not. So it really needs to be laid out more explicitly that, you know, these naturalized gardens should be allowed and encouraged. Um, what's a, a really one of the really important reasons why I'm, uh, I'm hoping you guys will decide to sign this petition when I send it over on Monday is because now is actually a, a really ideal well, there's an opportunity we have right now and within the next year or two. The use and care of roads bylaw is up for review and it's supposed to be done uh, or completed next year. And then the property standards bylaw is set to be reviewed um, in 2022. So these amendments are already overdue and now is the time to make them happen. Let's make enough noise about it so that um, um, hopefully the, the, yeah, the counselors can make it happen. Um, and I also wanted to, um, credit where I got these beautiful images. So I got them from a website called cornerpollinatorgarden.net and 
Yes. Okay. It's already been shared in the chat. Fabulous. Um, thank you guys so much. Uh, yeah, Barrett is is amazing. She actually spoke. Uh, she did a pollinator garden presentation for us last summer, which I think is on our YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, anyway, so she has a, a recent blog post about how she has actually um, sort of she has decided to to do this planting in her front yard. Uh, in spite of the bylaws and she has done certain workarounds where, oh, well, she's not, uh, uh, she's not spending too much money. She's growing all of these plants uh, from seed so that if she does have to, um, yes, she's, she's wonderful at, at sharing and educating, sorry, I'm catching up on the chat. Um, uh, so, so that if she were to have to tear it down, she wouldn't be losing a bunch of money in the process. Um, and, and she's she's very careful about it and everything and her garden is beautiful. Uh, so so yeah, it's a great it's a great resource. Uh, beautiful she has beautiful images and she shares um, the pollinators that come to her garden too, which is really exciting. So um, uh, I, I think I remember seeing on one of her blog posts she had some uh, species at risk show up at some point. Uh, so it's really interesting to see how she was able to transform her, her space. Definitely recommend checking out her, her website. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's another political opportunity here for more naturalization in city parks. Um, the ongoing development of the parks and the first ever parks and recreation uh, facilities master plan is the perfect opportunity to make rewilding initiatives a priority in Ottawa parks. Uh, the city's existing naturalization targets will remain ineffective unless more money is allocated to meet and maintain them. It's essential for city staff to be provided with the resources they resources needed to plant and maintain these spaces. It's absolutely not realistic to expect them to do so um, uh, without the budget to without the budget for it. So and, and what does that money go towards other than the planting? Uh, well, it includes proper signage um, so that not only like people recognize that the area has been blocked off uh, to to naturalize on it's intentional, um, but also signage to educate people to tell them why are they doing this and why is it beneficial and uh, why it's a great idea. Uh, and then the money also needs to go to um, training on how to manage naturalized spaces. There, it's it's different than um non-naturalized spaces where you kind of just need to mow it down every couple of weeks or months um including how to do this this maintenance and this management while mitigating legitimate safety concerns again like um like ticks or wild parsnips which wild parsnips i believe are more painful than um uh, than poison ivy so, and what's really unfortunate about this too is it unfortunate about the fact that the city has not had the budget uh, uh, for these initiatives is that uh, uh, it has resulted in the accidental mowing of small trees and taller plants in areas that were meant to um, meant to be left to grow. Plus, adopting naturalization process practices throughout the city um, will result in less maintenance work and cost in the long run. Uh, so it's definitely definitely worth everyone's while, I, I think, at least, and I hope you guys agree. I wanted to uh, credit the organization Naturevation for this graphic I took from their website because I think it's really cute and has a lot of really good um, really good factors of what enabling urban-based, urban nature-based urban nature solutions uh, involves. And obviously one of them there is, is fostering investment, um, making sure that the, the money is, is there for these initiatives. Um, 
see. So some of the other things too that we are advocating for through this petition um, is, is more green space protection. Uh, so many Ottawa residents assume that natural spaces are protected. Uh, however, this isn't, this is not always the case. Uh, and, and poorly planned developments and in, inadequate protection measures uh, continue to pose a threat to our local green spaces. So protecting vul vulnerable green spaces in Ottawa means um, demanding more sustainable patterns of development across the city. Uh, this includes less incursion of new development into vulnerable areas and maintaining clearly defined green spaces. Uh, better, and by better, we mean denser mixed use and walkable community design um, and planning practices, uh, more protection for species at risk, absolutely, um, and stronger enforcement of tools to protect local green spaces and species that rely on them for survival. Um, the last bit of this, this petition and, and the sort of uh, list of things that we're, we're asking for here, we're urging council to take action on, is educating the public on the benefits of rewilding um, uh, in urban areas is absolutely essential. It is still a really common misconception that rewilding initiatives mean absolutely no maintenance will be done. Um, uh, and that those areas will become a hazard. And that's not, that's just not the case in these kinds of, of initiatives. Um, on the contrary, maintenance needs to be done in a way that complements the type of naturalized area that they are, um, that, that, it, that it's intended to be. So for example, if uh, the areas are intended to grow trees, they need to be spot checked. Um, and treated for invasive species on a regular basis rather than regular mowing that would cut down all the baby trees and, and tall grasses and everything. Um, similarly, I think uh, meadow, meadow land, like if we're naturalizing something and we don't want a bunch of trees on it, but we it's kind of intended to be more of a meadow environment. Um, I believe I was talking to a city staffer and she had mentioned that the sort of best practice in those cases is actually for it to be mowed just once every three years. Um, and, and so those those practices are different than the maintenance practices they have right now. And, um, and so that, again, goes back to the money they need for the uh, training of these, uh, for training. So it's entirely possible to have naturalized areas that provide critical habitat for pollinators and other wildlife while also being safe and beautiful for residents and tourists to enjoy. Tourists, obviously, uh, when, we, when we can travel <laughs> again. All right. So I want to make sure we have enough time to talk about pollinator gardens and our um, pollinator garden fundraiser. Um, so we wanted to give you guys the opportunity to support urban biodiversity and Ecology Ottawa at the same time by purchasing uh, native plants. All of the plants are from Ferguson Forest Center and they'll be available um, for uh, available to purchase online until May 23rd, uh, from now until May 23rd, and orders will then be available for pickup on May 29th and May 30th, uh, just in time for planting. Pickup location is still be, to be determined, but it will be central Ottawa, there will be parking, and it will be accessible by transit as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic to Jess. As I said earlier, she's our lead pollinator garden fundraiser volunteer. She's also a graduate, graduate of the Masters of Landscape Architecture at Uni the University of Guelph, and she is here to talk to you about the different plants we have available through this fundraiser. Thank you, Natasha. Um, hi, everyone. Happy Earth Day. My name is Jess, Jessica, <laughs> either or. <laughs> As Natasha mentioned, I'm a graduate from the Masters of Landscape Architecture program at the University of Guelph. 
and I am going to take you through the 10 plants that will be available um, for the fundraiser, for the Native Plant Pollinator Fundraiser. But before that, if I could have the next slide, please, Natasha. Um, before that, I just wanted to show you a very quick um, video clip from Piet Udolf, who is a renowned landscape designer. And some of you have probably heard of him. Um, he is definitely somebody that I look up to in terms of uh, his perspective on native plants. Um, so I hope this can inspire you and you find a little bit of beauty in this short video. I see plants as a metaphor for a lot of things. I see plants as a tool to express yourself. Gardens are a sort of living picture. I live with my wife Anja in Hummelo, and we have a garden that is open for the public, particular time of the year, and that's what we do for 35 years. We collected plants from all over Europe, from specialist nurseries. But my work was more uh, changed by meeting people, uh, people that came from more uh, nature preserve areas or were more aware of native plants. So that's why I started to use plants in my designs that were probably wild plants and not used in gardens before or very, very little. I started to intermingle them, to bring them into my designs, and that created a complete different look to gardens. So it, instead of being ornamental, it becomes more loose and more sort of looking wild. It was not wild at all, but it looked wild. Although it might look simple, it's very complex. You cannot really rule it, you have to edit it. That's why I love working with perennials. You get a very personal sort of expression. In spring, uh, there's a lot going on without anything in flower, just a few things. But there are so many birds that making their nest and, and, and trying to get a partner. And so this is every day, it's one big sound garden. Most of gardening is sort of a household. And you go outside, you clean up your paths, you, you take out your dead flowers, that is traditional gardening. You make everything smooth so that it looks like your interior. I think I'm more moved by something that's dying sometimes than moved by something that's alive. When the flowers are over, you get seed heads, you get the grasses that flower, you get the sort of skeletons, and that has its own charm. It can be short-lived, long-lived, biannual, annual. So not everything has to flower at the same time. You go into it, you enjoy it, you take it in, because you know that the next day can be completely different. You can only just uh, guide it into the future. I don't try to change the world, but, you know, I, I just do my best to add something to the world of horticulture. Thank you, Natasha. <laughs> I see some clapping hands. Thank you very much for the support. Um, if you enjoyed hearing Piet's perspective as much as, as I do, um, he does, there was a documentary that was released a, a couple of years ago, and it's called um, The Five Seasons, The Gardens of Piet Udolf. Um, so I just, I've, I have watched this documentary and I strongly recommend it to anybody seeking to plant a wilder looking garden. He also has some very important lessons to teach about um, just how to view plants um, in general. And I don't know if you picked up on the one sentence he said about sometimes I'm more moved by something that is dead or dying, which, which yeah, I find is, is a really important lesson to learn, especially um, when too often we seek to make everything looking pretty, but there's actually a lot of beauty to be had in, in dying plants as well. So um, 
All right, without further ado, let's get into some of the plants that will be available um, for the pollinator sale. Before we continue, I just want to put a disclaimer in here as well that I am not a, a, an expert on native pollinator plants. It is something that I did research and study throughout my master's program, um, but there are certainly members in the audience here that are listening that have much more experience with these plants. So if you have any additional comments on any of the plants that will be available, feel free to post them in the chat and you're more than welcome to do that. Next slide, please, Natasha. So uh, the first one that we've got available here, and I'm going to kind of zip through these because all of this information will be available on the Native Plant Pollinator website where you can go and purchase these plants. So this is just going to be a brief overview to kind of introduce them. Um, the first one that we've got available is the Wild Columbine. Um, so as you can see, it has this beautiful red and yellow flower um, and the Latin, the Latin root word aquil means eagle um, to refer to the shape of the flowers. So that's an interesting tidbit of information. Um, this one can survive in full sun or part shade um, and it has quite a long blooming season with from early June to mid August. Uh, next one, please, Natasha. Um, the next one here, there are a couple that I noticed in the pictures from uh, Barrett Erickson, who I don't personally know, but I, I love her garden. <laughs> there are a few of these plants that I did spot in her garden. So this one being one of them is, is the butterfly milkweed. Um, this one is a favorite for butterflies, obviously, and there are these beautiful clumps of orange flowers. Um, this one is the only one that um, I would suggest to plant in a full sun area. It doesn't really like shady areas so much. It prefers to be in a full sun, so six or more hours of direct sunlight. Um, and it attracts, again, a, a wide variety of, of bees, butterflies, um, and hummingbirds as well. Next slide, please, Natasha. The next one is the New England Aster. Um, this one does grow quite tall at 125 centimeters spread and has a bit of a later blooming season and that'll be important. I'll, I'll touch upon that a little bit later in the presentation, but it blooms from about August to October. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, and it has these gorgeous purple flowers with the brown yellow centers. Next one, please. This one as well, I saw in Barrett's garden. Um, this one, the Coreopsis or the lance leaf tick seed. Um, this one has this gorgeous deep yellow flower color um, and, it, and it blooms slightly earlier from April to June-ish, um, attracts all kinds of native bees and, and butterflies and is not, is not so high, only gets up to about 60 centimeters of height and spreads about 30 to 50 centimeters. The next one, I'm sure you recognize this one called the purple cone flower or Echinacea purpurea. Um, interesting fact about this one, it is uh, the most widely used uh, in herbal medicine that we've got for sale. So um, when you take an Echinacea tea for, for symptoms of, of cold and flu, this is uh, the plant that that comes from. Um, this one has <laughs> these purpley pink flowers with a, with a brown cone in the middle. I love their shape. Um, they do get quite tall as well at 120 centimeters of height and they, they have a longer blooming season and tend to bloom a little bit later. So from July to September um, and they attract all kinds of native bees, birds and um, butterflies. The next one, Joe Pie Weed, um, another gorgeous pink flower. Um, this one does get very tall, up to 175 centimeters of height. Um, so as you saw in, in the little clip, the video clip with Piet Udolf, he kind of has this, this way of planting tall things with, with short things and, and things in between. So this one's a really nice, um, nice one to have in your garden if you're looking for a little bit of verticality, a little bit of height, and uh, that makes it certainly visually interesting. Um, it attracts birds and butterflies and is uh, blooming from about July to September. Um, it's also used for natural herbal remedies. Um, so that's really interesting. And the next one, Natasha, please. 
Oh, I love this one. The cardinal flower, Lobelia uh, cardinalis. I love these flowers, which are this, these, these spikes of scarlet red, and they've got a quite a unique shape as well. Um, they do grow about mid height, 70 centimeters height, and they bloom from about July to September and attract uh, butterflies and, and hummingbirds and can spread out a little bit as well, up to 60 centimeters. And this one, I'm sure many of you know this uh, flower, uh, the lupin, a uh, lupinus polyphyllus. So that's um, actually, it's not a sundial lupin, lupine, it's a uh, large leafed lupine. Um, so that's the one that will be available. And these ones have these gorgeous tall flowers with that are blue violet color with a little white streak on them. And they look really beautiful when they're planted um, kind of in clumps like this, as you can see on the images. Um, they bloom a little bit earlier, starting in May to about July, and attract all kinds of bumblebees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. And the next one we've got is the Monarda fistulosa, the wild bergamot, sorry, or wild bee balm. And these ones can grow a little bit taller at 110 centimeters height. Um, and they do spread out quite a bit as well, so up to 90 centimeters. They have a, a bit of a shorter blooming season from about June to July, um, and they're great for, for a variety of bees, for butterflies, and for hummingbirds. And last but not least, our number 10, we've got uh, the Rudbeckia, or Black-Eyed Susan, commonly called. Um, and these ones are these gorgeous yellow flowers with some brown centers. Um, and they, they bloom from about, they're, they're later bloomers as well, from about July to September. Um, and they attract bees, butterflies, birds, and insects. And they can get about mid-height as well and spread out to about 60 centimeters. All right, so those are the 10 plants that will be available for sale um, starting, starting this evening. And uh, just before I let you go, here are some tips for creating or improving your pollinator garden if you've already got one. Um, so there's lots of resources out there and I'm sure Barrett also mentions on her website some tips. So I'll just kind of go through these pretty quickly. Use native plant species. Um, that, uh, is, is a must. Native plant species are the best adapted to local conditions and they're the best sources of food and habitat for the local pollinators, local flora and fauna. Uh, a variety of flower shapes and colors. So there are some pollinators that will be attracted to some colors versus others and some different shapes. So uh, the widest variety that's possible uh, is, is recommended. Um, and let plant debris stand over the winter. This is a really important habitat for pollinators. Um, so in the spring, so to leave your plant debris over the winter and in the spring to only clean them up when it's above, I, I, I've always heard 10 degrees Celsius. I know there are some differing opinions there, but I've always heard wait till it's above 10 degrees Celsius for five consecutive days to clean up um, the, the dead plant debris um, from your garden. And then use a mix of plants that bloom at different times of the year. So I mentioned the blooming times for some of these plants. And it's really important to try to get some plants that, that bloom at different times. So to have consecutive blooms to provide a more consistent source of food for pollinators. Um, instead of just having plants that bloom, for example, in May and June, and then the pollinators don't have any more food in the rest of the summer months, it's really important to have um, plants that are blooming consistently throughout the season. Number five on there on the screen, you see add some flat rocks. Butterflies love to bathe in the sun. So if you can find a spot in your garden that's, that's really sunny, but a little bit sheltered, um, you can add some flat rocks there and that'll be kind of just like a, a stopping ground for the butterflies that come into your garden. And lastly, add water elements like bird baths and uh, bee houses as well. And this is just to provide to quench the thirst of the pollinators that come in and to provide a little bit of respite. And that's all I've got. So thank you for listening. And uh, I see the chat's very active. So <laughs> that means I guess there's a lot of questions or comments. So I'll throw it back over to you, Natasha, while I um, slowly read through those. 
Thanks. Yeah, and I think there's uh, some questions that you'd be better answering than myself. Um, but so to answer Lisa's question, this very last one, the plants for sale are uh, seedling. So it is clear on the website that all of these, the heights that were that Jessica, Jess was talking about um, are of the fully grown mature plants. And so the ones we're selling are seedlings. They are going to come in a um, four inch diameter fiber pot. So they're not, they're more than just sprouts, but they are, they are still seedlings. Ottawa does not have a rewilding plan at the moment. Um, we can absolutely share the link to the plant website. So it's Ecology Ottawa. Fun. No, someone beat me to it. There we go. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you. So something I actually wanted to do while we're kind of having this discussion and, um, uh, uh, answering any questions is actually, I'm going to stop my share over here. I can see all of you guys. Um, all right, so I'm actually going to pull up the fundraiser website and sort of go through it with you. Um, we had some questions about sort of, well, once you add everything to your cart, how do you check out? So I wanted to make sure it's really clear. Um, all right, here we go. So this is what you're going to see when you first uh, when you first get on the um, the fundraiser website. It's again, it's ecologyottawafundraiser.ca. Um, here's a little bit more information about um, uh, when the plants will be on sale until and when you will be able to come pick them up. Um, and then we've got some just nice images and stuff down here. If you click buy plants, which you can uh, click on the shop button up here as well, you can go through um, uh, you, you can go through them. So we do have the all of the individual plants that just just went through are listed here. But then we also are selling bundles of plants at a discount. Um, and these we kind of grouped in, uh, as you'll see, like our rainbow bundle has a bunch of different colored uh, plants. Our hummingbird bundle is the one that um, all of those uh, all of those plants will attract uh, hummingbirds that, or uh, and similar or related to what Jess was saying earlier about having flowers that bloom at different times of the year. We also have this bundle of flowers all season. So it's the um, lance leafed tick seeds, which bloom earlier, the wild bergamot, which blooms kind of in the middle of the year, and the New England aster that blooms later in the year as well. Um, so you do have all of these options to choose from. You also have an option of uh, adding a donation to Ecology Ottawa. Uh, this is a fundraiser for us, and so we are, we do operate on or, or through donations. We're able to um, host these events, keep them free and accessible um, through your donations. So we really appreciate them. You can um, select how much you want. Like if you wanted to give $10, you could do a five times two. Um, anyways, and so so let's say I wanted to do that. I'll add it to my cart and I'll scroll up and up here. Uh, excuse me, this is this is my cart and I can go through the the checkout process here. All right. And then I would just have to, you just have to fill in your information. You'll get a confirmation email um, and you'll get, a, a, like I said, you'll get updates on when uh, we've figured out the, the or confirmed, sorry, the pickup location, uh, as well as any potential COVID complications, but we're keeping our fingers crossed that that's not going to happen. Um, that, and sorry, I'm going to stop sharing now and catch up on the chat here. Um, There's a question, Natasha, about what percentage of the price of each bundle goes to Ecology Ottawa? I don't have that number off the top of my head, but that is something I'll include in the follow up uh, email. Sorry about that. Um, and can you repeat what the pickup days are there? It's the last weekend of May. So May 29th and 30th. 
Um, and then so the, the plants will be available though until May 23rd or until um, uh, until sort of supplies last. So make sure you get them in. We did have a really, um, uh, we, we launched this, this site officially at um, I think 11.45 today and we've already had um, a bunch of uh, a bunch of orders coming in so make sure you uh, you get your order in if you're interested uh, where for the pickup locations we have not confirmed a pickup location yet it will be central Ottawa it will be uh, there will be parking available and it will be accessible by transit um, Douglas are donations tax deductible unfortunately not ecology Ottawa, um, is not a charity. We are actually a not-for-profit too. Uh, the, our campaigns are far too um, hard-hitting and politically involved to, uh, to fit, the, fit the bill for a charity. So unfortunately, uh, the donations are not tax deductible. Um, there's a couple of questions here about will these plants survive the northern uh, temperatures, the northern climates? These are all plants uh, that are, yes, native to the area, so they will all uh, survive. They obviously not in the winter, they go dormant in the winter, but then will come back in the spring. Um, Carol Ann had a question about the flat rocks. The flat rocks are uh, for butterflies to come and hang out on. They really love bathing in the sun. Um, so if you could add a couple of those to your uh, pollinator garden, they would certainly appreciate that. Uh, somebody named PW asked for any that tolerate part shade. Um, most of these are part shade. I, I think the only one in my experience anyway that really likes to have the full sun is the, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm blanking on the name right now, the, the butter, the milkweed. The milkweed is the only one in my experience that um, wants to be in, in the full sun. Uh, maybe if someone else ha has had success growing them in, in kind of part shady environments, you could post in the chat, um, but the rest of these can grow in, in part shady conditions. Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm sorry, I'm trying to catch up on all of these chat questions here. Um, uh, one of the things I know someone mentioned are trees. So just a, uh, I, oh, I can absolutely do that. Sorry. Uh, just a very quick update on our tree campaign. Um, uh, unfortunately, we did have to postpone all of our tree giveaways until June now. We are trying to figure out a way to do curbside pickup from our office in downtown Ottawa. Um, we're still sort of working out the logistics of that, but hopefully we will be able to get you guys trees soon. And so there was another where, oh, there you are, sorry. There was another question in the chat of if I could show where to where to find the plants on the website again. So this is not our um, our regular website. It's ecologyottawafundraiser.ca. Um, and you can click here, just go to shop. Um, and then all of the plants are at the bottom there. Awesome. All right, so I think it's almost seven o'clock, so we are going to wrap up soon. Um, thank you guys so much for, for coming, and um, I hope you guys check out the Pollinator Fundraiser website and um, get some pollinators, uh, pollinator plants for yourself and can enjoy um, uh, some pollinators and uh, critters coming to your to your uh, naturalized gardens. Thank you so much for all the love in the chat. I'm really glad that you guys had um, a good time. Thank you so much, Jess, for being here as well and for all of your all of the work you've done. Natasha, I just want to add in here before we go. Maybe if you, I, there's a lot of uh, questions. I can't. We can't get around to answering all of them. But maybe what I'll do is I'll give you my email for the questions that we could not address in the chat, and you can send that out with a follow-up email in case uh, you had a question and and wanted to reach out to me. So we can do it that way. 
Thank you. Yeah, and we will, uh, we, we are able to save the chat afterwards. So I will be going through your questions again and uh, picking out any of the ones we missed to be able to answer in the follow up that you guys are going to receive on Monday. So again, thank you guys so much. Um, have a wonderful uh, rest of your evening and and uh, week. Happy Earth Day again. I hope you guys were able to get outside. It's still beautiful here. Um, I think I'll have to go for a walk after this. Yeah, it's just as getting blinded by the sun there. <laughs> a good time to sign off. Uh, thank you guys so much again. And uh, uh, yeah, we hope to see you soon. And all right, I'm going to end the call. Have a great one, guys. Bye.